Hello. Hi. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, good morning and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ray. I'm from Uber AI. Uh, it's my great pleasure to present our most recent work on open-ended reinforcement learning algorithm called Poet. And we have a follow-up called Enhanced Poet, where we aim to create unbounded invention of learning challenges and solution in a single run of AI algorithm. So before I dive into the content today, I want to briefly mention why I think machine learning and Uber are super interesting. On um, Uber, you, you probably know we actually operate on, uh, in, a, uh, in the actual physical world. Our manual problems are in the spatial and temporal domain, where we aim to build a very complex network with actual human and uh, with actual economic impact. So we are really aimed to moving real people, real things in the real world. That makes the machine learning problem at Uber uniquely challenged and uh, are very different than some of the uh, some online applications. Uh, Uber has been uh, dedicated a lot of efforts into open source. If you go to opensource.uber.com, you will notice that we have open sourced uh, several, uh, a, a lot of very uh, uh, top level projects. I, I list a few here, which are mostly in AI and machine learning domain. Uh, for example, uh, in the large, oh, we have Pyro, which is in the space of large scale probabilistic programming. We have Harvard, which is now an industry standard of uh, people doing distributed training uh, over different frameworks. And also recently we have Ludwig come from Uber AI, AI which is a code-free deep learning toolbox and many more. So free, feel free to check out open source at uber.com. Uh, we are also extensively publish our research at top machine learning conferences and you will find out those publications at research.uber.com. Okay, diving into our topic today. Um, I think generally pe people think machine learning or AI algorithms as a tool of, tools for solving given challenges. For example, uh, in image classification world, uh, where, where people will show in a, a algorithm a picture and, and the algorithm will uh, tell us whether it's a cat or a dog, in that kind of scenario, Machine learning algorithm has been doing pretty good in this famous ImageNet uh, context, context from Stanford. We noticed that ever since 2016 and beyond, we have uh, computer algorithms that are works now better than human being. For the task of playing video games, now we see that AI and machine learning are doing a really good job uh, ever back since 2015 when the deep Q network were first invented all the way up to 2018 and up to today. We have seen that machine learning has been successfully playing those very uh, those, uh, uh, interesting games called Atari games and people are now achieving superhuman performance. Uh, and of course, I want to mention the game called Go, and you probably heard about AlphaGo from DeepMind. Uh, in fact, since 2017, uh, machine learning algorithms with a lot of training and a lot of computational resources uh, is now reliably beat the world best human professional Go players, which uh, in the Go community consider a very, a very top kind of achievement for for artificial intelligence. And feel free to check out their movie in the in the in the link I provided here about this uh, uh, achievements. So this sounds great. I think uh, looks like machine learning and AI has do a lot of stuff. Can can be can be can do a lot of stuff if human tells them what to do and showing them a lot of examples. They are be able to do whatever human told them to do. Um, sounds like that. But on the other hand, I want to ask this very interesting question, and I would like to invite everyone to think about it. Can machine learning and AI be really creative? 
Um, by creative, I mean, can a machine learning algorithms invent diverse and interesting problems by themselves and solving those problems by themselves? Uh, to solving them, they will probably share and learn from their diverse experiences while they're creating and solving those problems. And hopefully, along the way, they will build its own curricular, just like human teach themselves uh, a subject. They can, the machine can hopefully teach themselves uh, uh, through a curricular they created by themselves and eventually solving something that uh, a, a naive algorithm cannot solve. Uh, I just want to say that machine learning and AI does expose some kind of creativity in generating new media and designs. One of the most famous example is uh, is a uh, game, right? Ever since 2015, uh, 14, people are using this type of technology to generate um, pictures, like uh, and. Uh, uh, for example, here the big game from from one of the uh, top institutions recently has shown a, a very uh, real picture. Looks very uh, the picture look all looks very real, uh, but however they were actually all generated by computers. Those they are fake fake images. So uh, looks like looks like machine learning algorithm have some creativity by creating something creating something that human have never seen before. Uh, not too much difference from what we have seen before, what we, what we can do before, but uh, it is something new. Uh, and uh, and through this process, machine learning exposes, machine learning algorithms expose some kind of creativity. But instead of diving to the GAN uh, algorithms, uh, I just want to point out a very interesting experiment that a group of computer scientists have done back in 2018. Probably more than that. Um, it's called Peak Reader. So they have, these are uh, a group of uh, computer scientists. They set up a website where a uh, human actually uh, can go to a website and, and just generate some random pictures at first. And then uh, on the back end, there is a, some kind of neural network called CPPN. And it is a, a self-evolving neural network, which means it will grow by itself. If you know about neural network, neural network is about, all about nodes and connections, right? So this type of neural network will start from very simple ones, a few nodes with a few connections, and they will start to grow by themselves, by adding nodes, adding weights. And they also, and this kind of neural network can also do paintings, right? So, so basically humans start to generate some random pictures, and sent to the, the back end, the CPPN gets a picture and they 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 paint the, the CPPN paint the picture and, and they they also evolve, become more complex and generate a little bit more interesting picture, hopefully, and send back to the human. And the same human or someone else which pick up the task will pick someone, will pick the new pictures which are seems interesting to them, and then send back to the system. So this kind of a human in the loop. Uh, process to generate things uh, together with the CPPN technologies. And in fact, they generate some very interesting pictures, I would say. Um, that was like more than 12 years ago. But if you look at these pictures, they were like real interesting. It's very hard to imagine. They're actually coming from completely random, noisy image, uh, images. And CPPN together with human, which tells CPP in which one is interesting. That's the only only kind of guideline that the neural network got. And eventually generate something that are really interesting. We, we got cars, we got uh, apples, we got human, we got uh, skull, we, we got like we got like even Jupiter. This is very interesting. So by examining the results, right, because we know where the picture comes from, it all comes from a, a, some random, random picture and it come a long way to whatever the final product is. So if you take a retrospect uh, kind of inspection of, of how this image comes from, you actually find out that the create, 
being creative, creative is very is a very interesting, a very thought provoking process, because you actually see a lot of step stepping stones along the way, right? Like for example, this、uh, G type of picture becomes a Jupiter eventually, and this、uh, egg with a hat eventually becomes a, a, a teapot. So there is like no kind of、um, actual relationship between these stepping stones, right? So this teapot. Uh, in in order to get this teapot, you first need to generate this、uh, egg with hat. So stepping stone almost never resemble the final product. That's what people observe in, in in this experiment. It's very interesting, and and eventually, and people might have something in mind. Like the people try to find a teap, try to find um, uh, like an egg, for example, at first, and then they find an egg with with hat, and maybe someone give up, another one pick up. And continue to find something interesting based on what people did before, what other people did before, and eventually they find teapot. So, so basically, this kind of experiment, this kind of neural network, enables enables、uh, people find things that you are not looking for. So we we consider this kind of process very creative. On、um, and these stepping stones. Are actually very important because they are the the ways that we solve hard problems, right? Like,、um, if you look at the key innovations happens in the human history for science and technology, you notice that sometimes if we want to solve some hard problem, we have to create some simple problem and uh, and uh, some something that has no relationship from the surface to the final problem you try to solve. And you kind of doing the ghost switching here. You solve some easy problems, solve some other problem first, and hopefully you identify some solutions you can transfer back to solving your original hard problem. So, for example,、uh, we have abacus from thousands of years ago, and、um, if people are just keep working on make abacus better, you probably will get a very long abacus, a very very with like more than with with like a More than just a couple of columns, you could probably got a a, a very fancy、uh, abacus that、like、people can operate. But actually, it's never kind of、uh, people. The history of computation never just take down that path.、Um, people discovered discovered、um, electronics, and from that, people invented computers, and that's a fundamental different technology from abacus. And people, in, because people invented、uh, invented some technology involved in electronics, completely from from a completely different application, and then people know people invent computers to solving the computing problems. This this shown that the stepping stones to solving hard problems, the stepping stone to very advanced technology, a capability coming from something that totally unexpected. And it's not like you keep working on one problem to give you the, the final solution. It's not always like that. Sometimes you have to do ghost switching. Okay, so what is open-ended algorithm here? Right, we talk a lot about what machine learning can do things. But machine learning, if you're giving them a problem, giving them a challenge, this thing's good at finding solution to it. On the other hand, if we combine it with a capability of creating new challenges, right? And we hopefully can create some very powerful algorithms that can really do do all these things by themselves.、Right? So it can start with some very easy challenge, solving them, and this this solution to the easy challenges could become a stepping stone, or could give algorithm a hint to create a little bit more challenging problems and find a solution to them. And then those will become a new stepping stone for new challenges and new solutions. And if we can create an algorithm that can constantly, consistently generate new challenges with increasingly challenge challenging level and diversity, at the same time they will find a solution to them. We will have a very powerful algorithm, very powerful machines, machine algorithms. If you think this is very this open ended algorithm is very abstract, I just want to name one such algorithm that is already exist. That is natural evolution. 
is think about it like back in a billion, many billion years ago, uh, life on Earth is as humble as a single cell. But in the past billion years, Earth has created tons of new challenge, new challenges, new challenges for life. And life and through evolution find its way out and grow in, the, in this spectacular, explosive uh, for a type of forms forming this tree of lives. So, and more important, very importantly, they create us and our intelligence. So just think this way. If we can create an open-ended algorithm, which can resemble what natural evolution do, it probably will take a lot of computation. But if we, if we assume we can get a lot of computation, we will probably creating something very interesting. Will this algorithm expose endless creativity? Will uh, this uh, endless creativity give us a better AI? Those are all very interesting problems that motivate us to do, to do the research along open-ended endedness. Uh, we'll formulate our open-endedness algorithm in the context of reinforcement learning. So I do want to spend the next two minutes talk a little bit about reinforcement learning. Bear with me if you already know the basic concept. So reinforcement learning is about solving a sequential decision problem. So the agent, here is a little robot, it represents the agent, which take observation from the environment or the world, outside the world. It get, uh, get some kind of state or observation from the environment. And based on that, it need to take some actions. And this action goes back to the world. Oh. Uh, and then generate the next new state. Uh, at the same time, it will also give a reward information to, to the agent, right? And the agent's only hint of such action is right or wrong is this reward signal. Okay. And, and finally, uh, the agent's ultimate goal is to maximize the cumulative reward, uh, either infinitely or over a finite horizon. Uh, for example, for example, if you are, uh, if this robot is navigating in, in, in this maze, right? So, so the, uh, it, it's, and the only reward he's got is, uh, how close he's, uh, he's, uh, he's closing to the target point. Okay. So, uh, and the agent, this agent, this robot sees like its neighborhood, like one meter, one, one centimeter around it. And so, Every step, it will receive this uh, surrounding information uh, from uh, environmental information from, from, from this world. And then it will take action, whether it's go up or down or left or right or make a turn or do nothing, right? Or, or uh, uh, and then it will, this, it will move. It will move and the, 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 the world will look different to him, to, to it, because it moves along this maze. At the same time, you get a signal saying, oh, are you closer to your final target? So how actual uh, reinforced learning is doing is actually involve a lot of uh, mathematical information. But overall, let's put it in a very simple context. If you are trying to play with this game, right? Now your agent is just this simple neural network and you and uh, your input to the neural network is those raw, raw pixels. The output of those neural network is the how much you, uh, how probable, how probable you should want to move this pedal up or down or stay the same. So, um, so you, you kind of, uh, the, the over, uh, the, a very simplified way of how reinforcement learning work is you have this, you have the random agent play in the world, right? In this game, right? <clears throat> you collect a lot of sequence of actions and state and real reward, right? And then eventually you, you, you either kind of get a little bit reward. Or you, you kind of lose again. So the red means lose again. The green means you win again, right? Then you have, you have record this sequence of actions, right? And then you, you kind of tune your neural network weights so that because this neural network decides which action to take, right? So you tune this neural network weights so that if you are really getting a really good results at the end, right? You kind of tune the neural network weights so that the actions you took along this sequence, okay, or make sure that all these actions are 
have a little bit higher probability next time you take. Okay, and then on um, for for the for the cases where you have very bad uh, kind of outcome, you lose the game, right? Then you kind of tune your neural network weights so that next time all these actions along this chain has a little bit less probability to uh, to take. And eventually by trial and error, by trial and error, you hopefully learn the agent which can get green green outcome more often and more reliable than a red com as 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 the agents start to learn and tune the weights of a neural network. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, Yes, by, by using uh, reinforced learning, people can solve uh, a robotics problem. For example, it's 2D, uh, 2D by paddle worker moving this obstacle course case. Uh, but people kind of also using reinforced, reinforced learning to solving even more difficult games or more challenging games like OpenAI 5 or, or solving Star, StarCraft. In the real world, outside the games, people have been using reinforced learning for robotics. Uh, here are some results from uh, Google Research and OpenAI, kind of like using re reinforced learning for solving uh, the manipulation task or the solving the uh, Rubik's cub cubic problem. So um, now let's get back to open-ended with reinforced learning, right? So why we want to study open-ended reinforced learning? So some people say, um, back in future, like especially, people are saying, oh, we have deep learning and we have reinforced learning, right? Deep learning is really good at learn representations and reinforced learning is really good at making sequential decisions, right? So if we combine with people who, with deep learning, with reinforced learning, now uh, 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 we have an algorithm which can um, do a good perception of the world and then make a good decision. So we pretty much have an AI. Um, it's kind of questionable whether whether this will work or not. Whether this kind of RL combined with deep learning is really called AI, and probably no one have the answer about uh, what is real AI. But I would argue that at least we should add open endedness into the equation, right? Because if uh, uh, AI is similar to what human can do, even like barely similar to what human can do, right? We have to have this capability for the for algorithm itself to create a new, uh, new problems for the same, for, for themselves. Solving those new new problems, building, uh, having those stepping stones, be creative and and creating new new challenges and teach themselves to solving them. So I think uh, because we can't just always give a task for. AI to solve and expect AI to really become expert of something. If you let the AI or machine algorithm to do image classification, it can only become expert to the image classification. If it's playing video games, you only work good at playing video games. It's very hard for an agent to really grow some kind of intelligence that resemble human. So we believe that at least open-endedness will kind of bring this important new gradient into the equation. Um, we we'll also have practical reasons why we want to start open-ended RL. Um, we think that if we can expose creativity out of these algorithms, it can help us creating problems and solutions with uh, increasing diversity, complexity, like to solving very challenging problems, like it could, could help us identify corner cases for safety applications where we actually can't always kind of count human to, to identify those. And as you can see here, like some of the, uh, we hope that open-ended algorithm can build its own curricular, right? Just as we, just we have shown before in some like pre previous experiment. If we have a curricular, and then uh, we, we have the hope of solving really challenging problems that cannot be solved uh, directly or by manually for human design a curricular, we, we want the algorithm to create something all by itself automatically. Uh, so uh, at, at Uber AI, we took uh, a few steps along this direction. And um, last year, we published the, po the poet algorithm. Uh, this year, we published the enhanced poet algorithm. And um, uh, at uh, leading uh, machine learning conferences, and we win some best paper award 
Uh, yeah, this year we get into ICML. We are very happy about uh, the the outcome of uh, uh, of the research so far along this way, and we also get a pretty good uh, media coverage. Uh, people are really interested in looking to this kind of algorithm and and kind of start to think about what we can do, what this algorithm can do for them. Uh, so I I would say uh, I I also want to take this opportunity to really thank all my co-authors and uh, uh, without them I could not uh, this research could could not move forward so really really appreciate them. So now let's uh, start to look at what this algorithm will will actually look like, right? Um, So we have in a so so we we said we 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 released algorithm called poet, and we want to know what is the what it what is actually the poet mean. So here we have a uh, a uh, uh, general slides about what the algorithm is doing. Um, it's called paired open ended algorithm, uh, paired open ended trailblazer algorithm, where the whole algorithm is about maintain and grow a population of agent environment agent pairs. So here, uh, we're talking about solving challenges. So the challenge here is an environment, right? Um, and an agent is trying to navigate or, or, or kind of a, get a good score in this environment. So challenge means environment, in this context is environment, and solution in this context means agent, right? So we do have challenges paired with solutions uh, throughout this algorithm. And this whole algorithm is about maintain a population of these pairs and grow these pairs, right? We're starting with one pair and then we create some new challenges. we we'll pair them with new new agent. And uh, and then we hope that in the later on, we will create more and more challenges and just also solving them by pairing them with pairing them with solutions, okay? So when an agent is paired with an environment, it's it it will it's it's only goal is to solve in that environment when they when it paired with uh with the environment and here we are adopting uh reinforced learning algorithms like as, as i mentioned later uh, earlier uh, like any 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 on out of shelf uh reinforcement algorithm as our inner loop for agent to solving the environment but this whole algorithm is actually about generating new challenges. So now let's put it in a context where people can understand, right? So uh, so now it's getting more concrete. Uh, our, our, our challenges or our environment is this uh, uh, 2D uh, by, by, by pedal walking obstacles, right? And we have an agent which is, uh, uh, which whose, uh, whose brain is a neural network and to try to navigate through this uh, uh, obstacle from left to right. And there's a real physical simulator runs behind. So uh, at, 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 at least in 2D, everything is actually according to the physics. And uh, on, on, so talking about environment, right? We actually here, we, we kind of encode our algorithm using this five dimensional vector, where it's giving me the range of stump, gap, and roughness, right? We have a mixed uh, some rough surface with some gap with some with some with some stump and to realize this encoding so first you can initialize all this encoding to to the all zero then it's a pure flat surface right it's no stump no gap and no roughness so and then by when i say generating new environments i mean permute or, or 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 kind of uh, mutate this uh, encoding vector. Uh, by by mutating this mu encoding vector, I mean it's adding a little bit noise, right? Random noise to each the entry of this encoding vector. And so okay, so now you might got a little bit stump, right? You might get a lot of uh, high stumps based on what I value add to them. You might got uh, some kind of a rough surface if you add some of the roughness, and you might get some kind of a gap if you add a, a range of gap here. And um, uh, 
overall, like you can also have a mix together, right? Because this, this encoding vector, once you take this range and this roughness value, it will have a generator, a random seed, and then it will kind of decide which section randomly are our stump and how the stump is height. Uh, what's the height of the stumps in a certain, in a certain range based, uh, based on the, the value you're giving. Okay, so we're talking about grow the population of agent pairs, right? Agent environment pairs. So uh, this slides demonstrate how we're actually doing it. So starting from existing environment agent pairs, we took a few of them, which we are making good progress solving them, and then we kind of uh, mutate their their environment, right? As you see in the last slides. So now we got a bunch of new environments, right? And uh, in, and we paired it with their uh, original agent, corresponding agent. And then we are going to filter them by their difficulty level, which means given the, 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 the current population of agent, right? We want to examine the, all these uh, newly generated environment and get rid of those which are too easy which means like it's definitely below the threshold of what we what agents can do now and we get rid of all those too hard where it's impossible to solving as as of now right those those impossible ones might be might be impossible as of now but in later on we might rediscover them and then maybe at that moment the agent's capabilities are able to solve them so we will bring them back but at a particular moment when we want to create a new task we just get rid of the ones that are too too hard or too easy. And also, we are rank those those new environment by their novelty, right? This is a we can uh, this is a cons a very interesting concept about no uh in how novel an environment is, right? We define novel as uh uh sim in in uh, in in one sentence a uh, novel environment means it looks very different from the existing ones. For example, a very bumpy one, well, a very bumpy environment will be very different from a flat surface, right? So we're actually looking at, like say, uh, also an environment with a lot of gaps, right? Are very different from an environment with just stumps. So so we're actually directed to, to measure the, the, the novelty of environment. We are actually looking for um, where we are mapping all the environment into uh, into their uh, into plan, and then we want we want to calculate the distance and find the one that are having the average uh, farthest distance, largest distance from the existing environment. And uh, we actually here in this research, we're actually using their encoding vector, right? As I just shown, the five dimensional vector to calculate their distance. Okay, so now we filtered by difficulty. And you rank everything by novelty, and then we pick the most novel one, and then pair it with the agent, the add to my population. So, yes, that's the only thing we have it here is when we when we randomly permute the current existing environment, we we filter them by difficultiness, and we we rank them by novelty. And we are lo looking for different interesting new challenges. They are not necessarily very hard, right? Because we already get get rid of them. If the existing population can already have a lot of challenging environment, we will basically just do something. We will just look for something really new. Okay, so um, we now have uh, we we will the, the whole system start with very easy tasks. Let's like say we have a flat surface, and agent learns to to walk on it, and then we start this process. Now we're able to create some kind of simple challenge. Um, where have a little bit stump or a little bit mixed environment, and the agent seems also capable of solving them. Um, and then what you, if you keep running your algorithm, you find out that the algorithm will be just doing those easy ones. So the very challenging ones, where high stump, wide gap won't show up because you are still missing one component. This I call it goal switching. As I prepared you before, the goal switching seems very important to identify no innovations, right, for human and for natural evolution. So here we are also introduce that kind of mechanism into our algorithm. We we're using ghost uh, we are using ghost switching here, and we're looking explicitly looking for stepping stones. Uh, 
we kind of uh, look for we, we in, in the algorithm where we we periodically search for uh, possible transfers of solutions from one environment to another environment. So basically, if we have a uh, if we, we we will double check if uh, if any of these agent paired with different envir environment actually does better in this uh, in this in this target environment, and if it's better, the one a, co a clone of of this uh, a zero will replace the existing paired agent. Uh, we're hoping to identify that uh, some kind of well, we are we're doing this because. Uh, <clears throat> As I mentioned before, stepping stone are actually coming from places you are unexpected, uh, like this uh, letter G become Jupiter, right? And also, we hope that people, uh, we, we hope that the agent can learn jump at one place, for example, uh, jump over gap. And hopefully that capability could help agent to jump over a stump. With all these algorithms in together, we will, uh, the following slides will give you like overall of everything. So uh, you have an easy agent, easy environment with easy agent. So now we create something median hard, and you get a new transfer agent and get a new pair of pair of agents. You create something too hard, you back off. You create something median hard, and solving them, and and all these processes can go in parallel. So you can you could go back and pick the easy one, generate another median, uh, median obstacle, and and transfer agent to it. You get a, another median hard environment and eventually you grow something just really hard right and initially you don't have a very good solution for it but however this transfer of solutions will enable you to uh, create a, a better medium hard solution and which eventually becomes really good for solving a very hard very hard challenging problems so here if you look at this very challenging very hard problems and its solutions and if you trace where this a6 prime come from right you actually notice that is is this agent actually get trained at different uh, at at an implicit curricular or implicit path that leads to the agent to here. Those are actually the curricular that this agent went through. So by using these algorithms, we'll be able to see agent that uh, now we will could see agents navigate through a very challenging environment created by the algorithm, and um, on some things getting interesting. Now we see some mixed environment, and we see agents now developed a very interesting, very um, uh, agile kind of type of uh, behavior navigates through all these challenging, challenging environment. And finally, if you look at the uh, 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 almost the mission possible environment, I call it downstairs heroes, right? If you uh, agent that are in this type of environment. Uh, it seems how very hard to solve, right? But actually, uh, poet actually find find an agent that can go to solve it. So see how kind of uh, uh, smoothness and nicely this this poet find agent can navigate through this uh, uh, seemingly impossible challenges like a kung fu master. Uh, you probably will want to ask like, what if I took some of the very uh, kind of challenging environment and solving them? By scratch, instead of putting into a open-ended process, can we solve those challenges from scratch? Uh, the problem now you this this shows that if you took some very <clears throat> took some challenges out of the one that poet can solve, and you try to solve it outside the poet process, you found that because of the missing curricular, by uh, missing curricular, you your your agent often stuck at at, at local minimum, and unable able to solve it. Also. This shows that if we took a hard challenge and you took the easy challenge and you manually created a bunch of like intermediate challenges that are interpolate the, the challenge level between easy and hard, right? You have this linear curricular created by hand. And now you are solving from the easiest one, one by one towards the hard one. And can you always solve in the most challenging environment? Well, this starts telling you that uh, maybe for some medium hard one, you will be able to solve it using this linear, manually designed curricular. But for the very hard one, you just can't solve it. And we have a proof in the, uh, we have like uh, empirical results in the results uh, in, the, in our paper showing that. So the, the, the reason that such a curricular, such a linear curricular, linear manual curricular cannot solve it, but <clears throat> poet can solve it, is because poet have goal switching. And 
we actually have um, we actually have um, uh, a, a, and this ghost switching created a very uh, very uh, powerful implicit quickler for the agent to solving the entire uh, problem. So, so solving the, this entire network of problem you know, enable it to solving a very challenging problem. You have to have in this. Okay, so I want to go a little bit deep on <clears throat> how this ghost switching sometimes be very counterintuitive. So let's say we have a fat surface, right? And you have agent training on this fat surface. You find out that the agent have never have any motivation to stand up, right? Because um, it kind of stuck at local minimum. It actually moves at 300 score, is a, 300 is a pretty good score, but it's never get a chance to, to stand up because it's never have, uh, it never need to stand up in order to move in, in this environment. So now this new, your, your environment to build hits a little bit, right? You create a little bit of stump in, in this uh, new environment and you can, you, you put your agent transfer to it. And of course the agent that are with his knee on the ground, crouching on the ground is always having trouble navigate through it. So the score will be low because it moves much slower. And later on, the agent in the stomping environment learns to stand up, right? Because he, he it needs to actually stand up a little bit in order to go over the stump. And you somehow put this agent, and somehow at a moment it actually beats the, the, the one that are on the ground. So it transfers back to the to the environment or the flat environment, and then it continue to optimize it and get a very efficient way a standing up way of navigating this flat environment. But if you don't go through this process, you just let this agent just keep running for like a very long time. You still like see the agent stuck in local minimum. It's never actually learned to stand up. I just want to point out that it's a very counterintuitive clicker, right? People always think quicker as solving something easy, enable you to solving something a little bit hard, enable you to solving something very hard. But actually, in this here, we, we, in, in the process of poet, we identify that there is a, a lot of cases where we, we, we have to improve in a harder environment here, the stomping environment. And then ultimately, by reusing those stepping stones, we ultimately find the best solutions for the easier ones. It's very counterintuitive. That also tells us that the ghost switching is really implicit and people really cannot um, pre-compute those those algorithms, I mean, pre-compute those, 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 those curricular, but the, the, the ultimate way is to let algorithm figure out the curricular by itself. Okay, so we talk a lot about uh, generating new environment, right, and how to solve them. So uh, you're probably uh, not satisfied by the environment where it only has stump uh, or gap, or like some, a little bit of roughness, right? So, um, this all seems really um, uh, uh, too simple to you, but you, you and, and you, you probably imagine that you will quickly run out of the, the variations. So, so in, the, in our, our follow up work to the poet, in the enhanced poet work, we actually look to solving this kind of looking looking into how we can expose more open ended discoveries by these algorithms. Right? We find out that we need to really use some environmental coding that are beyond the simple ones. Because these five dimensional vector can only describe, can only give you such variations and you can quickly run out of it. But what is the other way, what a better way of creating interesting, unexpected new new environment? Um, CPPN, right? Like as you can imagine, I mentioned CPPN before, CPPN can help you paint 2D pictures which are, which are completely stuck to your surprise. So, here we're using a, a similar technology here, CPPN now help you to paint uh, this landscape. And uh, uh, and because because CPPN is a neural network and neural network can give you arbitrary compli complicated 2D profile, you'll be able to create a very interesting, very challenging environment that way beyond what you can see while from this simple five, five, dimension, five dimension encoding. Uh, this actually created a problem. I see previously we said we want the novel, we want to find a novel environment and we're using the L2 distance of this encoding to tell you 
uh, how far away a, a environment to its neighbors, right? In order to find the one that are really, really different. So here, now we have a neural network which can generate an environment. How can we um, measure the, the, the environment, right? How can we measure the distance between environment? So very briefly, we have also developed uh, uh, something called environmental characterization, where uh, it's no longer dependent on domain, no longer domain dependent or encoding dependent, right? It's it's provide a way to kind of measures the the distance between environment completely uh, uh, independent of domains. So the the general concept here is we actually. Uh, when we get a new environment, we test an existing group agent in there, right? And we rank those agents based on their performance in that new environment. And the hy hypothesis or the, the, the intuition here is if a new environment invoke a, a completely different ranking of the existing agent, then it's qualitatively, a, probably qualitatively a new and very different challenge. For example, for example, here we have uh, a flat surface and uh, a bumpy surface, right? So agent with in agent with this leg very high will be uh, rank very low in this uh, flat surface because you never need to lift this leg very high to get an energy penalty from the score. Uh, but but in you know in a bumpy environment, this agent actually be ranked very high because. Uh, it's now uh, really need to 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 raise their, their their legs to go over those stumps, and that's why we think that this rank difference in, in this situation is creating because uh, these challenges are qualitatively different. Or, or uh, so I we think that's, that's a very good measure of distance. So we think the the technology we, we invented here captures the distinguished nature of the environment, um, and we we kind of. Uh, just based on performance of a ranking of agents instead of any other domain specific information. So that the way of measuring distance between environments become completely independent of the domain of the encoding mechanism. So just want to quickly share some results here. So now we were able to generate all kind of all these kind of diversity where agents are actually going through all these different landscape, uh, including some 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 are, some are really big and the agent will be able to Really land into feet and uh, um, all kind of interesting things. Also, we will we'll be able to generate a similar tree of life. Now I flip the tree, so we're starting the root, starting from here. Uh, if we are actually connect, like which environment are created by by its parent, and showing this uh, using the the uh, line to connect the agent to its parent and and parent to its children, and each of these. Uh, little picture actually uh, is a profile of uh, a, a, a landscape. As you can see here, uh, this new kind of uh, uh, family tree of environment really kind of, to some extent, resemble the, the tree of life. So we actually see that new interesting branches, deep, deep branches invented, which are also far away from each other and different from each other being invented here. Okay, so and to wrap up, um, we think that uh, poet algorithms, the enhanced poet, poet and enhanced poet, really unlocking the endless creativity of machine learning and AI algorithms. Um, they are a, a step uh, to us to truly open it algorithm um, because they are in a single round. They created um, problems and solutions that are increasing diversity and complexity. And we have shown that it can discover capabilities that could not be learned in other way, like in a direct opening, uh, in the direct optimization or, or, or manual, manual, um, or, or, or manual quicker. And more importantly, uh, in the, in the, in the enhanced point, we, we invented, uh, a domain dependent, uh, environmental characterization, which make it easy to try poet and other domains. So future work, we definitely can apply poet, hopefully in, a, in, in, a, in this uh, much more kind of complicated environment in 2D or 3D. Um, we can also kind of imagine if there are any real world application of this, whenever there's a simulator or something. Yes, 
So feel free to explore the usage of Poet. And to facilitate that, we released our, our code uh, in, in a public domain, and we are welcome everyone to try it. Uh, yeah, that's all about my presentation. And uh, um, thank you so much. Uh, and we can, uh, um, I don't see any questions here, but feel free to ping me at the Slack channel. Um, yeah, that's, that's all. Thank you. Um, yes, yes, yes. Yes, please, please um, ask a question in the Slack channel, and uh, I will be happy to answer all those. And uh, using our code to to try to try poet on your own domain. Thank you.